the apostles, which we read at the beginning. I find it difficult to take any particular verse as my text tonight, as I rather want to review the message of the entire chapter taken as a whole. It reads at the beginning like this, you remember. And in those days, a number of disciples... Hi there folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to see you. We're doing a lecture uh, today on the Burn Show uh, on the life of Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones. This is a lecture that I researched uh, a number of years ago. I've given the lecture before and I'm going to give it again today. And I hope that you enjoy the lecture. Uh, thank you for coming to hear the lecture and uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. Uh, so we'll begin the lecture and um, as follows. When I've done the lecture, I will give you a recommendation to 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 um, to Lord Jones's books. Okay, we're looking at uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, who was known as the Doctor, and he was known as one of the great preachers of the 20th century. Lloyd Jones was a native Welshman born in Cardiff on the 20th of December 1999. His father, an intelligent man, ran a dairy shop, and the family always felt that their father could have been a professor, but for the lack of educational opportunities in his youth. However, he methodologically read the newspapers and instilled in his children a love for reading. Um, the doctor had two brothers, Harold and Vincent. The boys grew up uh, in a stimulating environment, were well looked after and dearly loved. The meal times at the Jones house were times of opportunity of political debate. Their mother had a good head for politics and could give us good as she got in debate when the doctor was a boy and uh, she got a boy England was ablaze with the radical politics of the Prime Minister Lord George this fiery Welsh fiery Welshman held a continuous fascination to Martin Lloyd Jones and throughout his life he retained a, um, a passion for the history of the politics uh, spanning the Lloyd George era especially the 20s and 30s at the age of five, uh, the doctor's family moved to Langethlow, a small town in Cardiffshire, in the heart of South Wales. His children's years were happy and unrivaled until 19 or uneventful until 1909. His parents' home caught fire, and the boys were saved by being thrown from a bedroom window. In 1911, won a scholarship to a school in the nearby town of Tregeron. Here, his superior mental ability became evident. Under the influence of his teacher, S.M. Power, the doctor developed a passion for history. Um, this passion or love for history, especially church history, was one of the gifts which made him a powerful leader in his day. During the 1930s, evangelis, evangelicalism in Britain was weak and flabby. Christians were pessimistic and frightened by the rise of a secular age. The doctor would remind them that the 18th century had seen a decline of true religion, but through Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, revival came to change things around completely. And he, he would tell them to go on and... And, and say that what happened can happen now. His practical use of history in this way was a real tonic uh, to a battered and bleakered evangelicalism. He's taking a drink. A Welsh Calvinist Methodist. The heart of the doctor's love of history rested in his Welsh Calvinist Methodist roots. The secret of the doctor's magnetic preaching lies here. This preaching was to become famous throughout much of the world for its spiritual vitality and the ability to change lives such as 
had been seldom seen. His Welsh, his Welsh passion, uh, married to his Calvinism, gave an excellent balance, and the fire gave an emotional edge to the preaching. But his Calvinism provided him with a doctrinal and intellectual element of everything he said. Thirdly, it gave him spiritual zeal. Humanly speaking, these were the gifts that made him a mighty preacher he was. To hear the doctor speak was like listening to a hurricane. From the pulpit his voice came swelling down where it whizzed you up and transported you to heaven itself. There was nothing like it, bursting with a passion and a glow with truth. Oozing with this love for God and for souls, it was awesome, and the majesty of God was proclaimed. As his family used to say, it was logic on fire. The doctor loved his Welsh Calvinist Methodist roots so much that he would often go on a pilgrimage to Landelo, uh, or Landi Dealo, where a statue of his hero, the Welsh revival preacher Daniel Rowland, stood. There is a photograph showing his, him standing near this statue with his grandchildren. The children are playing, but Lloyd Jones' face is of an intense seriousness. A romantic respect for his hero seems to shine from him. In the 1914, the doctor's father's business folded, and the family then moved to London to start a new life. They were still experiencing financial difficulty. To earn extra money for the family, Martin worked as a bank clerk, and after his father's business packed up, he was able to go back to school and resume his studies. At this time, the family attended a Welsh chapel, also attended by the doctor's future wife. Martin often returned home late from school because he had slipped into the House of Parliament to watch his hero, Lloyd George. Lord George and his contemporaries believed in the social gospel, the rhetoric of this was that there would there can only get better things can only get better this can be achieved by educating the masses men are naturally good and once they are educated they would be liberated to do the right course of action education was a means to help people discern the use that use that to discern and use that goodness the churches were viewed as schools which were important for this teaching when the doctor became a minister of the gospel, his early ministry was spent in showing that the view of this view of man was wrong. His sermons show that he believed man was not naturally good, and it was not education which man needed, but a change of heart. He believed in the doctrine that man must be born again, changed by the power of God's Spirit. At the age of 16, Martin entered medical school at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London. It was and still is a famous institution where only the brightest students were admitted. There was an old saying, you can put a Bart man, but you, you can tell a Bart man, but you can't tell him much. It was clear to his contemporaries that he was a brilliant he was a brilliant young man. So it was not long before he came under the eye of Lord Horton. Horton was the most eminent medical professor in England, and he was well known among his students for his Socratic method of reasoning. When the doctor was at his height as a preacher and leader of evangelicals, he used Horton's Socratic method to stimulate his congregation to think. In Bible discussion, his method was to uh, to get people to to think out the negative and positive aspects of an issue using the Bible as the main reference point. Students were especially attracted by the doctor's emphasis on the importance of using uh, using the mind. He always said that the mind was a gift from God and should be used. In 1921, Martin Lloyd-Jones gained his medical degree and became a member of the Royal College of Physicians. He also became Lord Horton's chief medical assistant, which many another medical man would have given their right to for. The, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' life in the medical world was not altogether satisfying. Although he was regarded as a brilliant man, he felt empty inside. His emptiness grew worse as he saw the vanity of life, and he had access to the rich and famous. He became aware of an unhappy, immoral, upper-class strata. The Prime Minister, for example, had a mistress, and some politicians had syphilis. However, the doctor, that's what he was nicknamed as, or Dr. Martin Lord John, was converted about 1921. God convicted him of his sin. There is a little record of his actual conversion, the writer has unearthed a rare autobiographical account which reveals a classic conversion similar to that of John Bunyan, where the hand of heaven pursued him until he trusted Christ. 
Dr. Lloyd-Jones says, I am a Christian solely and entirely because of the grace of God, not because of anything I have thought and said or done. It was he who by his Holy Spirit quickened me and awakened me to the realization of certain profound and vital truths taught in the Bible. He brought me to know that I was dead in trespasses and sins, a slave to the world and the flesh and the devil, that in me dwelleth no good thing and that I was under the wrath of God and heading for eternal punishment. He brought me to see the real cause of all my troubles and ills, and that of all men was an evil fallen nature which hated God and loved sin. My trouble was not only that I, I did things that were wrong, but that I myself was wrong at the very center of my being. This led me to the realization that I was helpless as well as hopeless. For can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots, all moral teaching and moral effort were useless, for God demands perfection, and I could not atone for my sins, and I could not please God in the present, or hope to do so in the future. Then he revealed to me the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, who had come into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. He taught me that Christ had died for my sins, bearing my punishment in his death upon the cross, and that he also rendered a perfect obedience laws upon my behalf. As the result of this, God forgave me freely, and in addi addition imputed the righteousness of his Son to me, regarding me as if I had never sinned at all. Moreover, he created in me a new nature and made me a new man. He adopted me into his family as one of his, as one of his sons, and showed me that I was joint heir with Christ, and of a glorious inheritance in heaven. By the grace of God, I am what I am, sola de gloria. That's the testimony of Dr. Martin Lord Jones. As the doctor turned to Christ, or Dr. Martin Lord Jones turned to Christ, his generation were turning away from Christ. In 1921, intellectuals such as Bertram Russell were challenging the old order. His book, The Problem of China, was a ferocious attack upon European colonialism. The Bloomsbury Group were were changing the way society thought by advocating free love. And Bernard Shaw and the Fabians, with their peculiar brand of socialism, attracted many throughout the nation. Though there had been the First World War, these intellectuals still spouted that the, would become a better, the world would become a better place if only people would look to them as their prophets. It was in this intellectual climate that the doctor took up the challenge to the modern thought of the day. In 1921, he gave a talk in the, on the importance of education to change Wales, but in 1924, he gave another talk where it was clear that his thinking had been revolutionized. He now saw clearly that his contemporaries and the nation were not morally decadent. Then in 1925, he, he lectured on the tragedy of modern Wales. His thesis was that the only hope for Wales lay in the gospel, the glorious gospel, and not in education alone. His views caused a her horrific uproar among rest in Wales. The liberal social gospel ministers openly attacked him. And Bethan Phillips, at this time, uh, was two years older than Lloyd Jones. And she was a beautiful intelligent and had the choice of many possible suitors. As the doctor was uh, developing as a, a preacher, uh, a popular courtship venue, um, uh, courtship ensued between the doctor and Bethan. There was a popular courtship venue for the Youngs in those days, which was the tennis court. Now this was a handicap for the doctor as he hated tennis and Bethan loved sport. But he was to was in love, so putting his inhibitions to one side, he played the game. Bethan decided that of all the men who were chasing her, she would have the doctor. She saw in the young man not good looks, but an honest heart, and this was what she desired. The couple were married in 1927, a perfect match. She was one of the few women of her day to have a university education. Consequently, it was not only an emotional union, but had a strong intellectual dimension also. Their marriage went from strength to strength. The doctor recognized that he could never have been the preacher he was without the help of Bethan. She was the practical partner who kept the domestic side of their life running smoothly and efficiently. The story is told that when the doctor was in old age and washing up, Bethan, noticing his slowness, tutted and said, Come on, Jonesy, 
she knew he was notorious for being impractical. Critics uh, received a shot when Lloyd Jones resigned his medical, brilliant medical career during the first uh, first years of his marriage. He accepted the call to be the minister um, of a church in Stanfield uh, at, at Port Talbot, South Wales. His contemporaries thought he had gone mad, and many thought him to be a romantic fool. The doctor felt that he should put his money where his mouth was and he believed that the gospel was the only hope for Wales, therefore he would go and preach it. This was a brave step. Sandfield was not an attractive place. The community struggled under high unemployment and a massive drink problem having seen the devastating effects of drink. The doctor became a teetotaler for life on top of this. It appeared to rain constantly and the little streets looked dreary and when the doctor arrived he was asked what can you do for these people I can do nothing he replied but God can do everything over the years the doctor gained a reputation for expository preach as Ian Murray has pointed out in his essay the Evangel evangelistic use of the Old Testament in the preaching of Dr. Lloyd Jones the doctor himself was first and foremost an evangelist Throughout his life, he preached an evangelistic sermon every evening. It is important to note this because the doctor held views which could cut across modern outlook of the subject. At Stanfield, the church used drama and the choir and social groups in an effort to convert people. Today, there is a widely held view that the best way to reach people is to entertain. The doctor believed that the, this method of evangelism, evangelism was unbiblical and was actually destructive to the church. He looked on the church as a heavenly institution and not a place of entertainment. The only way that people can be brought into this place where God dwells in the heart of believers is if God opens their eyes of spiritual reality of Christ. God this, does this through a preacher who uses the word and the spirit. Success depends on the holiness of the preacher. If he is a man of prayer and of a holy life, God will bless his efforts. The use of entertainment downgrades the time the, the true meaning of the church and the importance of God's actual means of evangelism. Consequently, you scrapped the Stanfield social activities and embarked on the old-fashioned method of private prayer and preaching. At first, the church uh, grad, uh, became a little bit empty, but gradually more and more were converted and added to the church. The doctor's method of evangelism endured to his retirement, and it was always blessed and proved that this was in the best way the right way. In 1929, 70 new converts joined his church. In 1970, 128, his preaching was criticized as being too intellectual for his working class congregation. His reply that the working class were just as intelligent as their so called social superiors certainly is working class congregation of preachers message especially men like the drunkard Staffordshire Bill. The doctor's preaching grew ever more powerful. 80 um, powerful uh, 80 more came to his church and some had to be turned away and the whole of Wales was soon gossiping about his preaching. In 1932 the doctor was invited to America on a preaching tour. Twice on his travels he met the Reverend Shields who was known as the Canadian Spurgeon. The two had an interesting conversation which reveals the doctor's style of leadership. Shields and Lloyd Jones were in agreement in in condemning liberalism and the discussion was about how to deal with the such a heretical movement. Shields preaching tended to be very critical and harsh on the liberals. The doctor was concerned for Shields and advised that the best way to combat error was to preach truth positively. He felt that critical preaching would ruin Shields career. In 1935 the doctor's influence widened when he became involved with the Interversity Fellowship, a body set up to encourage the spiritual lives of students in the universities. Johnson, the general secretary of the organization, pressed Martin Lloyd-Jones to become involved and the doctor's contribution was to prove outstanding. During the 1930s, the IVF was an uh, unadventurous social club for Christian students. 
these students tended to shy away from debate with their peers because they felt that Christianity had no intellectual credibility. The doctor changed this whole anti-intellectual ethos. He guided the IVF to be more doctrinally conscious and they began to publish theology rather than sentimental devotional literature. At the conferences, the doctor demonstrated students that they had nothing to fear from science and modern scholarship. By 1939, a new breed of evangelical students was emerging on the university campuses throughout Britain. It was spiritually minded and an intellectually confident generation. And 1939 was to prove a catalyst in the life of the doctor. The Stanfield congregation suffered a heavily blow when he informed them that he had accepted an invitation to the pastorate of Westminster Chapel, London. He had not taken the decision lightly and he felt he could be more widely used by God if he lived and worked in the capital. At Westminster Chapel, the doctor shared the pulpit with the great and aged minister Campbell J. Morgan until the old man died in 1945. Lloyd-Jones was in the prime of life and his preaching revealed that his sermons were full of passion, riveting and solid. For 30 years his congregation were kept spellbound every week. His grandchildren recall how awesome he was in the pulpit with his Geneva gown and stern face. He believed that, that preaching was the greatest call man could ever have and this reverence for preaching made him different. God blessed his respect, his respect for preaching by giving him the unction of the Holy Spirit from 1939 to 1968. The doctor expanded upon the Sermon of the Mount Ephesians and Romans, providing a veritable spiritual feast for this for his listeners. Though a union in the pulpit, a lion in the pulpit, he was a lamb in the vestry. He was the most approachable of men, and countless people came to him looking for help and advice. They found a wise, loving man always willing to help. He gave a small fortune away to those who were in financial need. In 1943, the doctor inaugurated the Westminster Fraternal. Every month, ministers met at Westminster to, dis to discuss an issue or listen to a, a lecture. Martin Lloyd-Jones became the leader of over 400 ministers by 1960. His spiritual leaders from different evangelical backgrounds were given encouragement and sound advice. The doctor had a real affection for these men. Just like Nelson, who called his captains the Band of Brothers, so too with these men, the doctor was simply the pastor's pastor who looked after his men with devotion. When J.I. Packer was a student at Oxford, he visit, often visited Westminster Chapel through the influence of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He became interested in the Puritan writers such as Sibs, Bunyan and Owen, and Packer asked for a conference to promote interest in the old divines. The doctor felt it was an excellent idea and have offered the chapel and its leadership to get the conference off the ground. At first only 20 came and eventually an average of 200 attended. The conference became a real blessing by contributing to the post-war rise of Puritan thought. The renaissance of the Puritan literature gained momentum through the Evangelical Library. In 1920, Geoffrey Williams and a handful of Baptist ministers ran the Free Grace Beberton Library. The library was a gold mine which housed some of the finest Puritan books ever written. And when the doctor came across the library, he immediately saw its significance and the Puritans had not been published for years and were very difficult to come by. The library would be a way of introducing Christians to these works. So he gave the library his backing and was made president and renamed it the Evangelical Library. A building was procured in London to house the collection and God used the institution as it proved a real blessing. Then we have Jack Camos Cum Cummins, uh, a financial assistant, and Ian Murray, editorial, um, with his editorial zeal, the Banner of Truth Trust was set up to publish Puritan and Reform literature. The doctor was, so, was to be co-helper and advisor to the trust thought uh, throughout its life. At first he was concerned that so many reform publications produced too quickly may run ahead of the work that had been achieved in introducing the Puritans to new readers. Nevertheless, his reservations were not, found, were not founded. The trust, the trust was very successful. By 1957, two 
two titles were in print and on the market in 1958. These books were quickly followed by the works of George Whitfield and these of Jonathan Edwards, then Watson's Body of Divinity, sold over 2,000 copies. The Banner of Truth success was in large measure the result of the doctor's preaching ministry at Westminster Chapel. It was there he brought thousands under the influence of the Puritans, so that when the Trust started publishing, there was a ready market for solid spiritual food. The Trust continues to have a powerful effect today. I myself have been greatly blessed by their publications, and many of my contemporaries. Herbert Lockyer said that it is confident to know that at the heart of English evangelicum, evangelicalism lies a strong Puritan view. This has largely been a result of the Banner's faithful witness over the years. It's interesting, what I'm trying to say here is, Lloyd-Jones was at the forefront of a renaissance in scholarship, in thinking, and in Puritan writings. Uh, he inspired the Evangelical Library and the Banner True Trust. These were major landmarks in uh, Evangelicalism in the 1950s and 60s. But that influence has tailed off uh, recently. I feel it's valid at this point to note briefly why the Puritans thought is so valuable to the health of the nation spirituality and why Dr. Mark Jones was anxious that it should be reviewed. So William Perkins in 1558 to 1602, Richard Sibbs 1577 to 1635, Thomas Goodwin 1600, 1699, John Bunyan, Richard Baxter and Jonathan Owen are a few of the names who deserve attention. The, commu the communion bond was their mighty love for and knowledge of the scriptures. They were spiritual giants Many wrote their books under political and religious persecution. John Bunyan, for example, spent 12 years in prison. and They had a high view of God and a low view of man, and they believed in the importance of Christian doctrine, such as the fall and the deity of Christ and the resurrection. They believed that Christian life is a battle, and they wrote, they wrote volumes on how to fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. They were, in short, spiritually mature Christians. Christians, Jaya Packer, said Jaya Packer. These men spent long hours in prayer and Bible study, a far, a far cry from what modern Christians are doing today. The Puritan heritage is an authentic Christianity because it is biblical, and as such, it has always influenced evangelicalism. In the 17th century in Northampton, the minister Jonathan Edwards experienced extraordinary revivals. Who was Edwards influenced by? He was. He read the works of the Puritans. In the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon, the Baptist preacher, whose congregation in London numbered 1,600, also read and lived by the Puritans. The great need of the hour is for evangelicals to get back to the Puritans. Then we have the IFEC, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students. This was another great institution which the doctor helped shape. After the Second World War, evangelical vision to reach the student world for Christ. In 1949, a conference was uh, held to stimulate interest, and the doctor became the fellowship's uh, chairman in 1947 to 57, and president from 1959 to 1967, and vice president for the rest of his life. As usual, the doctor ascertained before coming himself to the organization that it had a solid doctrinal base. His major contribution was in uniting students of the West with those of the East. The 1960s, America was agog uh, with the subject of racism. And Martin Lloyd Jones ensured that the students from developing countries had an equal share in the leadership responsibilities and had those from the richer nations of the West. As basically encouraged the Eastern students to have just as much influence as the Western students. The Western delegates were not in agreement with this issue, but the doctors will pervaded. After the doctor's death, the membership numbered 300,000 students. It still continues today and is renowned for its strong stance on evangelical orthodoxy. In 1954, Billy Graham, in 1954, Billy Graham's crusade was being watched by millions of the British viewers and it was an exciting time. And the crusade was heralded as the greatest since that of Moody. 
very quickly Billy Graham became the darling of evangelicalism in Britain and everyone was captivated by his sincerity and love for Christ. The doctor was the only major evangelical leader to come out against Billy Graham. He did so for two reasons. Firstly, he felt that Billy Graham paid too much attention to the outward signs of conversion. He asked his converts to come on down to the front to accept Christ and sign a pledge card. Mighty and Lord John stressed that what made it was a change of heart achieved by the Spirit of God. He felt that the use of modern methods lost sight of the inward work of God. His second objection was that Billy Graham shared his platform on occasion with Roman Catholics and liberal theologians. The doctor felt that this was a wrong because it, determined, it undermined the importance of Christian doctrine. He was concerned that a generation of Christians would not be committed to the truth if they were grown up in a climate where Catholicism and liberalism were seen as acceptable. Though the two men had their differences, the doctor had a profound respect for the American evangelist. In 1971, Billy Graham asked the doctor if he would chair the Luzon Conference on Evangelism. The doctor agreed on condition that he would not have to share the platform with Catholics and liberal leaders. Billy Graham would not consult to this condition. I think that I, I understand where the doctor's coming from. He's coming from a Calvinist background, and the Calvinists are suspicious of the Arminians, and Billy Graham is seen as an Arminian. But I think that many, many Christians did get converted in the time of Billy Graham. Uh, I don't agree with Billy Graham's ecumenicalism, uh, but he did. Um, he was used of God, I think, to have an influence, um, a big influence like he did. Then we have the ecumenical movement was another death blow to evangelical orthodoxy. After the death of Spurgeon in 1892, evangelism grew weaker. The post-war return to sound theology led by the doctor was not enough to stem the oncoming tide. In 1925, the Stockholm Conference saw the gradual formation of the organized ecumenical movement. In August 1948, more than a hundred churches came to Amsterdam to decide on the formation of the World Council of Churches, the flagship of the ecumenical movement. The constitution of the council had minimal teaching and there was no doctrine of the Trinity and liberals were freely accepted. The organization rapidly increased in power, sucking in large denominations and evangelicals. By 1954 it had become a serious threat to evangelicalism. Then in 1959 the new Pope, John XXIII, shocked the world by calling an ecumenical council Thus the Catholics became involved in the ecumenical dialogue. By the early 60s they dominated the ecumenical movement including the World Council of Churches. The doctor saw the signs and he was ready to call an alarm and he knew that if the various denominations united event, inevitably doctrine would be downgraded in order to achieve unity. He also recognized that evangelicals joined the movement, doctrine would have to be jettisoned to please the rest of the group. In order for the gospel to be properly proclaimed, truthfully uh, presented, it was impossible to let, let go of sound biblical doctrine. In the doctor's pamphlet, The Basics of, Basics, Basics of Christian Unity in IVF 1962, it makes it clear that the true basis of the Christian life is principle. If we get rid of the principles, we have nothing. He encouraged evangelicals to stick to the doctrinal principles, come what may. 1966 crisis. As the ecumenical movement grew stronger, the Anglican evangelicals maintained denomination and mainline denominations were, were joining its fold. There were few who were willing to stand for principle. In 1966, the doctor spoke at the Evangelical Alliance Assembly of Evangelicals in London. His message was an important turning point in evangelical history. He warned that the evangelicals were in danger of being swamped by the ecumenical movement. He did not wish to be negative so offered a positive substitute. Why not all evangelicals in those denominations that have become liberal join together as a loose affiliation of evangelical churches? John Stott, a leader of the Anglicans, evangelicals opposed the doctor. History is against you. The audience became electrified by a possible debate between the two 
heavyweights. Doctor went on to the doctor went on to advise ministers not to act emotionally. Sorry, Scott went on stopped John Stott, the Anglican uh, leader, went on to advise ministers not to act emotionally on the spur of the moment. But the damage was done. Many misunderstood Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. They thought that he intended them to leave their denominations and join together as one big super church. Some viewed him as a liability, too critical and divisive. Lloyd Jones was above all a realist. He recognized that denominations were inevitable. His ideas were that each evangelical group within a, in a denomination would associate and identify with the evangelical community as a whole rather than with the liberal elements in the denomination. Opinion was split, those who agreed with the doctor and those who did not. In 1977, the Anglican Evangelicals declared a public willingness to join the ecumenical challenge and therefore drifted away from their evangelical independence. The split revealed publicly what had actually been taking place privately for some time. It revealed that many evangelicals already had ecumenical tendencies. The doctor challenged such sympathizers to stand for sound doctrine or they would drift towards those with liberal views. In 1963, Watson and Harper, ha Harper experienced what they felt were revivals. They believed that Martin Lloyd-Jones might be able to advise them on this amazing work of God. It was a result of his preaching that they had come to pray and wait for revival in f the first place. The doctor agreed that it was a time a rev that it was a revival and encouraged them to keep on. It was the commencement of the charismatic movement. About this time, Lloyd Jones visited America and found similar meetings there and again, felt that God was working. The word charismatic was not used at this time and it did not become a world movement until the late 1960s. The South African pastor Pelesi was invited to speak at a conference in England and it was apparent that Pelesi became the spokesman for the new movement. He had worked for the World Council of Churches and made no secret that he disliked doctrine stating that it was not essential to salvation. The doctor became increasingly alarmed by Pelesi's comments and realized that many who supported the new movement were being influenced by this man. He preached a number of sermons in 1964 of the doctrine of the spirit. It was not an attack on the new movement but on dead orthodoxy. He was concerned about those churches who had sound doctrine but no life. The teaching that the Holy Spirit enters a believer on conversion was correct, but there were those who developed a self-satisfaction and rested on this desire to, know, to have no deeper walk with God. The doctor pointed to the fact that many such Christians' congregations were dead and failing the modern world. The need was not for restraint but for life, and he stressed the need for the baptism of the Spirit, the constant outpouring of the Spirit upon the church. His sermons were published in 1980 and caused a tremendous controversy. Misunderstanding of this book has been due to a failure in appreciating this historical context. By the 1960s, after studying and reading about the charismatic movement, the doctor was deciding against it. It was the movement's teaching on prophecy which he could not agree with. The Bible, he said, tells us to prove us all things, prove all things, even prophecy. But they did not check all the prophecy with scripture. Furthermore, stress was placed upon the experience of the power of the Spirit, but there was a tendency to shy away from teaching and doctrine. Also, with Pelesi's leadership, the movement became ecumenical, liberal, or Catholic. It did not matter so long as you were baptized in the Spirit. The 1970s were a watershed for evangelicalism. Francis Schaeffer, the great Christian apologist, said the evangelicals have simply become worldly. Worship and practice had changed on a scale our fathers could never practice, uh, could never have imagined. The basic doctrines had become weakened and neglected and in some cases entirely destroyed. Confusion abounded and it was a standing joke that evangelicalism meant, meant anything and nothing. Carl F. Henry, editor of Christianity Today and a close colleague of 
Billy Graham noted that evangelicalism was weaker than it actually looked. The doctor's analysis of the situation was the same as Schaeffer's and Henry's. He traced the influence of the desire for experience to D.H. Lawrence. Students were tired of the mind and wanted passion. The church, instead of resisting the trend, accommodated it and tried to use it for its own ends. The Anglican charismatic David Watson said, We no longer need preaching, we need to appeal to the senses. Drama and dance communicate better than preaching. It was the age of superficiality and evangelicalism for evangelicalism's sake. Activities and entertainment have become the norm and worldliness has increased. Few voices were raised against the new evangelicalism. Dr. Marty Lloyd-Jones and Schaeffer's were among the few who spoke out. The doctor urged Christians not to get bogged down into controversy, but to get back to the basics. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is permanent and must be proclaimed in all its fullness, and he reminded them that revival could come at any time and urged to strengthen what remains. He also reminded them that the Lord could return at any minute. Therefore, be sure to live and walk in faith. The doctor retired in 1968. He visited America for the last time in 1969, lectured on preaching at the Westminster Theological Seminary. In his spare time, he prepared his sermons for print, and they were published by the Banner of Truth. In 1970, his first book on Romans came out, and the Atonement and Justification were published, a major event in the history of evangelicalism in the Evangelical Library. Other publications follow throughout the 70s. He spent less time amongst the wider evangelical community. He began to work for an evangelical succession for the next generation. With this in mind, he spent much of his time with young ministers, encouraging them to the future fight when he had gone. And one of the most enduring pictures of the doctor is the time he lavished on his grandchildren. Some had married, others were at university, and he gave them spiritual books and encouraged them to read Jonathan Edwards' works. They found him a source of strength to whom they could trust and turn to. The doctor had been ill with cancer since his retirement on March 1st, 1981. He uttered his last words and he said that his salutation was all the his, his salvation was all of grace. He worshipped God and the great man died. Um, I'm just going to finish with some reflections since then. I think since then things have just got worse in evangelicalism. We've had theologians who are set denying the doctrine of hell, denying the atonement, theologians coming up with new ideas about the Apostle Paul and what he taught. We've had the rise of Bart Ehrman in America and we've seen evangelicalism has become extremely weak indeed. But God is good and God is overall and he is sovereign and he knows what he's doing and he's a great God and he will maintain his people and he will strengthen his people and he will provide for his people and he will bless his people and he will save those whom he wants to save so keep trusting in God and looking to him I'm going to link to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones recording trust there you'll be able to listen to his sermons and I trust that you'll find them a rich blessing if you want to read the full life of Lloyd-Jones volume 1 and 2 of Ian Murray's biography of the banner of truth is essential reading it's been made into a one volume and if you want a, a light read then get the one volume some essays on Lloyd-Jones called Chosen by God by C. Catherwood but, uh, published by Highland Books is very helpful. Catherwood's um, book on Martin Lloyd-Jones, fa The Family Man, published by Kingsway, is a helpful introduction to the life of Lloyd-Jones. Martin Lloyd-Jones, The Man and His Method uh, and His Books by C. Catherwood from Evangelical Library is a helpful little pamphlet. 
Martin Lloyd-Jones Letters, 1919-1981, published by the Barn of Truth, is a very helpful uh, piece of literature about the life of Lloyd-Jones and what he thought about issues in those letters. Old Testament Evangelistic Sermons by Martin Lloyd-Jones, published by the Barn of Truth, is a very helpful collection of sermons. It gives you an idea how to preach evangelistically from the Old Testament. The Basis of Christian Unity, Exposition of John 17 by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, IVF, is a very good pamphlet. Uh, I don't know if it's published now, but it's very helpful. A lovely little book, Memories of Stanfield by Beth and Lloyd-Jones, 96 pages from the Banner of Truth, is a wonderful book uh, concerning the early days of Lloyd-Jones' ministry. The Gospel of God, Romans 6 and 7 and 8 are a good series published by the Banner Truth that will be a rich blessing to you. And also Dr. Martin Lloyd John's Spiritual Depression is another good book that you'll find a help. So I hope you've found it an enjoyment learning about the great preacher. Uh, Lloyd Jones means a lot to me. Um, and he has inspired me in many, many ways. And I hope if you're a Christian that you'll be inspired by his ministry and his influence. God bless you. And spread the word about Lloyd Jones and get people reading him and listening to his sermons. Let's start a new movement of people getting into Lloyd Jones because as we get into what he has to say, we'll be led to Christ and to worship and adore him. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones and his ministry. We thank you for all that he did and all that you did through him, Lord. And Lord, we pray that his influence would continue to be felt today and I pray Lord that you would bless us to be faithful like he was and that we would share your gospel in these days in Jesus name Amen thank you for listening and God bless you